taught me. Henlo? Yeah. I mean, it's like hello, but a little different. Oh. Henlo. Henlo. So. Um, so we actually have like something really special for you guys today. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, we're not going to talk very much. We're going to let someone who's smarter than us Yes. <laughs> um, who is far more eloquent than either of us are. Much more. So we um, are going to show you guys. We, we had just, um, post, not just. It was a couple, oh, it was a couple, couple weeks ago. At least by this time this video comes out. It was probably a bit ago. Yes. But <laughs> about a cult called Zendik Farms. Yes. Art Farm. Zendik Art Farms. Yes. Um, and we have a special surprise for you, which is that one of the sources that we used quite a lot within um, that video, mm -hmm. which was Helen Zuman, um, is actually speaking to us today. I know! She, she um, reached out to us via Reddit, Reddit. Um, and she agreed to do a little like Skype video uh, interview with us, and we actually just got done with it, but we're going to show you it now yes. yes also my name's caitlin oh yeah i'm janine we're the real lady killers that's us hi. um hi <laughs> um but she's well, she's super sweet and amazing and just very very intelligent very just awesome she's I don't know. she's a very warm person i mm -hmm. think we were both like we both came off of the call being like whoa she's so I know. so nice like, god she's so nice so yeah without further ado we are just gonna kind of here. Here she is! Buy her book! <laughs> oh yeah, buy her book. Yes. Hi! Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Good. I'm Janine. And I'm Caitlin. Oh. Hi. It's nice to meet you. Nice. Thank you again for doing this for us. This is so awesome and we're really, really excited. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thrilled to be here. Yay! <laughs> um, so first off, we just want to know a little bit about you. Um, can you just tell us what you're like doing now and like some of the stuff that you're into, I guess? Like general about me information. Right. Um, well, so my, the book, Made in Captivity, came out a couple months ago. Um, I, you know, was working on that, you know, off and on for 12 years. That's been a big part of my life. Um, and since it's come out, I've been very busy, you know, promoting it, talking about it, just sending it out into the world. I've discovered that books don't sell themselves. <laughs> um, so, you know, newsflash, um, having to do a lot with that. I also, um, for for money, mostly, I edit college application essays. Oh. That's a job. So I do that part of the time. Um, I spend a fair amount of time at Earth Haven, which is a village in North Carolina that I found out about kind of by way of Zendik, um, through sure. someone I knew who used to live there. It's a non-cult community. Um, <laughs> non -cult good. community. Yeah, very a healthy form of a village, <laughs> and I really enjoy being there. I do some gardening. Um, I, I have done more food growing and farming in the past. Right now, not so much. And I, you know, spend time with people I like and hang out in my other sort of village environment of my tiny city of Beacon. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So, first of all, we're interested in your life pre-Zendik Farms. And why you think that, for instance, we talk about a little bit later, like, you're a deeply intelligent person based on, like, we just looked at your background and was like, wow, she's Harvard educated. And, like, I was watching one of your um, videos about certain kinds of economic systems um online on youtube which i thought was really really interesting so i think there is a big question of how does such a deeply intelligent woman end up in this situation <laughs> yeah so so um when i was okay so when i applied to harvard one of the questions was where do you see yourself it was either five years or ten years i think it was ten years from now so like six or so years after college after graduating from college and my answer was I don't know, but I do know that I don't want to be a doctor, I don't want to be a lawyer, and I don't want to be rich. Thanks. That, you know, let out a number of paths that my classmates looked around at, 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 at what other people were doing who were in my situation. I mean, there were, you know, there were 
tons of people heading to medical school, to law school, into banking, consulting, um, you know, all, all these, all these fairly secure paths to a lucrative future. And to me, those just seemed dead inside. I, I looked at that and I was like, oh, so you're just going to keep make, helping the world go around the way it is going around right now, which doesn't seem terribly healthy. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. At my college graduation, I gave a, a friend and I staged a protest against Alan Greenspan, the former nice. chair of the Federal Reserve, who was our graduation speaker. It was, I, it was my idea because I heard about him being our graduation speaker. I was just like, he's a banker. He's going to be so boring. <laughs> Don't you have something interesting? <laughs> so, and then my friend is an activist, and so she got on board. So we staged a protest. We walked out on him with, like, 200 people each carrying a very large red balloon. So, and, and we had a counter commencement across the street, which was a tradition that we discovered had happened at Harvard in the 60s or 70s. And I gave a speech at that, at that counter commencement about the difference between manipulation and touch that we were being groomed to go sit high up in office buildings and manipulate people's lives from a distance. And I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to learn. I wanted to be outside, touch things that were alive, interact with real people, real beings, um, you know, learn how to homestead and grow food, um, you know, go back to the land um, to, to connect, you know, mm -hmm. with humans and, and other beings. Um, and... I, um, I also had an experience before my last year of college, I lived at the Dudley co-op, which is off campus, off campus ha ca um, house at Harvard for, you know, Harvard kids who hate Harvard, um, <laughs> who are total, who are misfits and like, don't, don't want the sort of luxury experience of having other people do everything, you know, for them, which is really kind of disturbing. Um, and that was my first experience of feeling like I really belonged somewhere. We were cooperating and collaborating to run the house and there was sort of a hippie vibe and I was like well I want more of this like that feels good to me and um so and, and I got a grant right before graduating to to visit intentional communities you know in North America to grow their own food um which was sort of my way of looking for a more permanent version of the Dudley Co-op and I, I I bought a book called the Communities Directory which had listings for all these various communities um and you know what set out visiting them and so on um, I was, I felt like I was giving all these choices and my answer was none of the above. So I went looking for something that did feel true to me. And this kind of relates to my current understanding of, of what cults are and what purpose they serve. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, you know, I think that cults wouldn't exist if we had a healthy culture. Um, that <laughs> there are, there are deep deficits in our culture, deep absences of things that people really need. And cults spring up in order to, in, well, they don't necessarily spring up in order to meet those deficits, although sometimes maybe they're trying to, but they, they, they promise that they will meet those deficits. And I think I was responding to some deficits. And also at that time, um, there wasn't much. Um, the, the phenomenon of college-educated kids going to work on farms and mm -hmm. stuff like that, it wasn't as common back then. Um, and Earth Haven, for example, like barely existed at the time. So I was kind of, I didn't have many examples to follow. And, you know, then it seemed, it, it seemed promising. So I like the term that you used um, in your alternative commencement speech, which has to do with like manipulate, manipulation versus touch. Do you think that's a huge deficit that people are having that they're not and why they might go to cults, like, is the feeling of not being able to actually, like, interact with people on a personal level, not interacting with their environment in a personal level, like. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think so. There's a book I just read by Courtney, mom, I forget what it is called, but it, it, it's, it's a novel, but it's about exactly, she's a trend forecaster, and she's working with a technology company that's wanting to produce more and more digital products, but she looks into the future, and she sees, she sees a resurgence of interest in actual touch, people actually being with each other in person. And in the book, she uses the term impersonism. Um, and when I lived at Zendik, um, you know, for all its faults, it was sort of like a small village. Yeah. We were all, on, you know, on this one property. Um, you know, if I needed help with something, you know, I could go find 
the village electrician or the village plumber or the village carpenter. Um, it was just constant interaction. If someone called on the telephone for one of us, um, it'd be like, okay, where's so-and-so? And just, um, so it was, it was a very, it was a, just a, a constantly interactive lifestyle, you know, among each other. And Nice. And I mean, like, we would assume that there is that kind of positive aspect to it, because otherwise, why would you have joined? Like, people help the people. Yeah. About the farm, what were your initial impressions about Wolf Zendik? Because we've heard, so just out of some interest in that kind of, those relationships. Okay. So initial impressions of the farm and initial impressions of Wolf. Yes. All right. So my initial impressions of the farm um, were mixed. Uh, there were some things that felt kind of weird to me, like when I showed up and I was told that I was on quarantine, that I had to um, eat, I had to, you know, choose a fork, a knife, a spoon, a bowl, and a plate and put my name on them in masking tape, and those would be mine, and I would have to wait 10 days till I could wash dishes or help in the kitchen, um, you know, as a way to prevent germs from spreading throughout the community. Um, that I had visited other communes that hadn't happened there, so that seemed kind of weird to me. Also, where I was living, I was living in like a plywood box in the back of the barn loft with a bunch of other new people who were all guys who, you know, I was like, that was a little weird to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I felt, I felt this sort of separation. That, that, it didn't strike me as like, you know, creepy or something, but also I was really impressed by most of the people I met. They're all, you know, these young people who are mostly very attractive, very good shape, you know, farmer tans, um, <laughs> had all these practical skills that I didn't have, seemed to know what they were doing and seemed very sure of themselves. Like, they knew what they were doing with their lives. I didn't. I was like, I want what you have. Um, as far as Wolf, um, I never met Wolf. Run away quickly because I um, didn't get along with my father and was primed not to trust men. Got along really well with my mother. I still do. And was primed to trust women. Um, however, as far as this, I've encountered this too, um, this difference in how people view Wolf and Errol, um, and that, you know, Wolf sometimes gets a, you know, a better rap than Errol does, and I, I strenuously object to that, nice. um, partly because of things that, I, that I've heard from people who did live at the farm when he was around, um, like that one time, he, 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 he lined, he lined all the women up and decided how much each of them should weigh, which was, you know, <laughs> okay. and they, and everybody had to go on a diet in order to <clears throat> weight that he desired, which by the way, is similar to what Keith Rainier of Nexium did. Uh -huh. he, he liked his women skinny. They all got really skinny. That's just one example. But, um, I see, I mean, Wolf met Errol when Wolf he was about 40. She was about 20. She had just come out off a, a series of extremely traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. She was very vulnerable. Um, he was, he had already set himself up as a guru. Um, and so I see her, um, as his first follower, the one that legitimized following him for other people. Um, and I also heard that he, from the beginning, um, when they first started living with other worship roles in the group to do things that she didn't, she really didn't want to do. Um, so, um, and, and, and he, and he, he was, he, he was, he was the guru. I mean, he was the one who was being lionized, whose words were treated like the gospel, um, so, and, and he was, started it and what she was, what she was doing was, um, was at least originally and possibly for a very long time after that was to please him. Wow. Interesting. That's really interesting. Cause we really, I mean, all the sources we could find really only talk about Errol. I yeah. Guess, since she was alive a lot longer, but. And like the abuses. And I do think that's interesting in yeah. terms of gender politics, like that Errol would be placed in this like very evil like, yeah. position. where people just, like, look past Wolf. Yeah, because yeah. so most of the stuff outside of... You're one of the main mm -hmm. resources we were able to find on Zendik, but outside... Like a thorough research. Yeah. Can we get a sense of what your initial impressions were on her? Yeah, um, so when I... My first interaction with her, um, he, you know, she was like, oh, you know, you're Helen, the chick from Harvard. I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a short conversation about, the, um, and she said something about New York being a real shithole. And I was like, um, sort of, maybe, kind of, but 
you know, but it I mean, it wasn't that bad. So I, I, I sort of, you know, answered that in a political way so as not to offend her. Mm-hmm. And then she said something about, um, you know, Zendik, like, you know, not being like college and being a much more, a much deeper commitment. And I was like, um, okay, that I don't really understand what you mean, but you seem really sure about it. And she, you know, and she was, she was a very intense person with a very intense gaze. And, and I had that t- sense, I think, at that time and, and, you know, later on too, that there were, there were things, there was like this deep, mysterious well of knowledge that she had that I didn't have. And so she, when she said things that were a little bit cryptic, I, I was like, well, I don't fully understand that, but it sounds, you know, it sounds interesting, you know, and maybe if I stick around, you know, I'll, I'll have this weird penetrating mysterious wisdom that you need to have. <laughs> so, so she brings up, I think the fact that it's such a huge commitment. Can you speak on why you were able to make that kind of huge commitment um, to Zendik Farms? Yeah, so, I mean, it was a very gradual thing. When I first got there, I was just planning to stay a couple weeks. I mean, I, I, you know, I I figured I would just, you know, leave and hike the Appalachian Trail or something. Like, I I didn't go intending to stay. I just went, I went intending to just try it out. Um, But, you know, I was surrounded by all these people who were, again, very, you know, attractive and articulate and sure of themselves. Um, I really... I really wanted their approval. I wanted them to like me. I admired them and wanted them to like me. Um, and I, you know, and I was, I was quickly immersed in, in their way of life. I didn't really have, I, I didn't really have free time. I was just with people all the time, either on a work crew or at a meal or, or, or you know, something like that. Um, so, and also in my particular situation, like I didn't have a car and didn't know how to drive. So I had arrived on the bus, I had received a ride to the farm from some appendix. So I was sort of physically isolated. It wasn't, I couldn't just sort of go somewhere and be by myself for a while. Um, and there was, the only phone I had access to was in the room on the farm. So private conversation wasn't an option. I didn't really flag that as a problem at the time, um, but it kind of was. So I was just sort of surrounded, um, you know, by this this situation, um, and uh, and I abstained, you know, and I and I was and I was really I had I had all this grant money. I had received thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. Um, I only spent five hundred of it because I was really afraid of spending it the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And in a way, staying in Denmark was a was uh, by staying in Denmark, I could relieve myself of the responsibility of what to do with this money. I never had anything like this amount of money before, and I thought, well. I don't know what to do with the money, but I could, if I stayed and gave it to Zendik, um, they seem like they, they would know what to do with it, and they'd do something good with it, and I wouldn't have to pay taxes and, like, be a federal war machine. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that was something. But it was just, it was just a, it was, it was a gradual process. It was partly, uh, partly driven, um, you know, by my surroundings, partly by, like, the attractions. Oh, and I, of course, early on I learned about how dating worked. Um, which is very attractive to me that there was a third party system where if I was attracted to a guy, I would have to, I could ask one of the two dating figures to pick him up for a walk um, and just, you know, you know, hang out, make out or date, meaning go to a private space and have sex um, for me. Um, and, you know, I, I was very, uh, um, very unskilled, shall we say, at the dating camp. So that was, so that was, that was, that was interesting. Those factors um, together, you know, and I, and I didn't, and there wasn't anything, you know, drawing me somewhere else. I didn't know of anything, anything better. I thought they said they were starting a revolution and that, you know, I wasn't fucked up. The world was fucked up. Like, great. Yeah, man. You're like, true. I know we got very confused on some of the aspects of how dating worked in the commune. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, <laughs> So we, we noticed that certain people, specifically like Errol's children, were able to have like more committed significant others, whereas other people weren't allowed to have those same kinds Unless of connections. Unless it was like approved by Errol? Yeah. Is that, is that uh, correct? Is that how that worked? The, 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 the pattern that I saw over time, so um, Errol, um, Errol and Wolf together had uh, one daughter um, who... Um, I call 
well, I, I call her Swan in the book. Of course, her real name is Fawn, and that's mm -hmm. well known, well known fact. So, um, Fawn was allowed to have long term relationships, mm -hmm. um, and as far as I know, when those relationships ended, it wasn't because her mother told her they had to. Um, other people, I mean, there was there were, there's a couple I'm thinking of who who were together for, but in my time there. Um, the pattern was that if two people got close to each other, you know, got really into each other, it was only a matter of time before, um, you know, they were told that they were square or in a bubble. Um, and the remedy that was suggested was usually like have dates with other people. You know, um, that might happen or Arrow might say, you know, you guys can't be this phrase, get an apartment, you know, mm -hmm. like if, if you're only, if you're just into each other, you know, at the expense of the revolution, then you should just leave and get an apartment. Why were those kind of tight-knit relationships antithetical to the revolution? Um, well, there there was no revolution. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, this is a common pattern in cults, is that um, for, for, the, for the thing to work, um, you know, the, each individual's strongest loyalty and strongest bond must be directly to the leader. So if any other bond crops up that threatens to be stronger, that bond must be broken. And that bond could be between a man and a woman, between um, a, a parent and a child, between two people who are really good friends with each other. It really didn't matter. But those bonds could not stand, um, you know, and, uh, yeah, they just, they were in conflict. Did you ever feel incredibly isolated in that kind of environment then? Uh um, definitely. I mean, when you ask that, what comes to my mind is just these experiences of um, going on selling trips. You know, we'd go out, we'd go out in the street to sell our magazines and uh, music and stop bitching, start a revolution. <laughs> um, and I was, I, w I was an okay seller, and I had my my fine moments, but I wasn't a natural at it, and I, you know, often didn't do very well. Um, and I just, you know, I remember these terrifying mornings, like, when I, I, would, I would have done badly the night before, and I'd wake up in the morning, and, like, the moment I woke up, I was like, oh, my God, now I have to reckon with what happened yesterday. And, I, and just, you know, knowing that someone was, or either I or someone else is going to have to come up with... Um, some underlying reason why I hadn't done well, like something wrong with my philosophy or some way that I was competitive. Those were like the moments of deepest aloneness. And then actually, this is interesting. 16 years ago today, July 10th, 2002 was the day that I left. I left the farm wow. um, for, for two months. I ended up coming back. Um, it was what, what was called an out. And, um, and I, and I did that sort of out of desperation because I was so miserable um, and I thought it was my fault, but if I went out and got a taste of the death culture, I would return with, you know, greater, you know, fur for the cause. But I remember, like, you know, but simply making the request to leave for any length of time, once I had been there for a while, that was an act of betrayal. I, I was, I was nobody. You know, I, I was, I was, I was utterly alone. I was toxic. Um, so... Yeah, just there, there was a there was a very I, I could always sense, you know, whether I was in or out, and when I was out, it was incredibly long. Yes. So, what were the factors that made like that pushed you away from Zendik Farms? Like, what were the things that I assume it built up over time? But like... um, sort of. I mean, I I didn't. I didn't make a conscious decision to leave. I left because I was told to leave. I was kicked out. Um, and also, that had caused me to lose heart kind of on a unconscious or semi-conscious level. Um, one thing was that part of, the, part of the main promise of Zendik for me was this idea that it was the only place on Earth where I could have a um, lasting, honest relationship with a man. That was part of our story, was that Errol and Wolf were the first couple in history to manage that, and the only way to achieve that was to get the farm and apprentice to Errol. So I believed that, and I thought I could have that at Zendik. Um, about 
uh, it was a little more than a year before I left, that hope was dashed. I, 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 there, was, there was one man who I was together with on an offer. Errol said she was going to help us to be the model of the couple. And I was like, I have arrived. You know, now I am getting somewhere. Um, but that didn't last very long. And, you know, I think, you know, a few months later, she, she sort of she condemned our relationship and said, actually, it was very bad. Um, so we broke up. And, and, and after that happened, I decided I was going to give up. That, that the next time there was a conflict between, you know, my love for a man and my loyalty to Zendik, I was going to drop him immediately. So I, I, I thought that I, that I could give up on this very deep desire that I had for a long-lasting relationship with a man. And in retrospect, I would say that I really couldn't. And so I think that I, I did sort of lose heart for the cause when that happened. But again, it wasn't conscious. And it, it, consciously, I was all for Zendik, and it, I was the one who had screwed up. Like, oh, well, I... I I can't handle this love thing. I, you know, I guess that's that's too bad for me. Um, it, but then other things happened. When we moved, the whole farm moved to North Carolina to West Virginia um, about a month before I left. And um, so, and, and during that move, things went a little haywire. So Errol, um, she would sometimes, well, she she she, she would, you know. She would sometimes change her story. Like one time, she um, it was the summertime, and she she wanted us to you know do, get more work done. So she told us that if that if, if we all got up earlier in the morning and went out to um, went, you know went out started work earlier, that we could have a siesta during the middle of the day. We were like, great, that sounds like a good deal. It's really you know hot and all day. A couple weeks passed. There wasn't really any provision for a siesta. <laughs> So, but, but, but enough time had passed that by the time she said that, I was kind of like, okay, fine. During the move, um, things happened that were contradictory, um, like that there was this guy, um, a, a realtor in the area, whom she had been denouncing for years as what we call the spoiler, who was just, you know, destroying the ecological balance of, of the area. Um, she hired him to subdivide and auction off the farm. Mm-hmm. That was a little weird. Um, and there were other things that happened that, 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 were, that were contradictory, but she was in a hurry to sell the farm and move, and she wasn't doing the best job of, like, repairing her story as she went along. And I did notice some of those things, and there were some moments towards the end of my time in Zendik where I had thoughts that I was like, what is she doing? And I immediately stopped those thoughts. I mean, I thought of them as, as crimes, as thought crimes. I should not be thinking those things. So I didn't go anywhere. But they were there, and I, I knew they were there. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I think Errol was a very sensitive, you know, savvy person. I don't think she could read my mind. But it's possible that she was sensing something, you know, something about me um, and seeing me as a liability because of that. I also hadn't been making much money, you know. So there's, there are a bunch of layers to, you know, my departure and her, her decision to set my departure in motion. Okay. So I, I think this is probably maybe an obvious answer question, but why do you think, because a lot of what we could tell about Zendik is that it had a lot of um, environmentally, environmental focused philosophies, and it was a lot of people who deeply cared about the earth and promoting those kind of values. So why do you think that sex became the center it seems like, of a lot of the issues and a lot of the politics within this cult? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. You know, like, I would say that sex and sexuality are, are you know, a really effective um, means of control. I was just at a, a conference, the um, International Cultic Studies Association Conference, and one of the presenters said, if you you want to control people, control their sexuality. Um, so I think it was, it it was a major means of control. It was a source of, it was a source of pleasure. I mean, Mm -hmm. we worked a lot, we worked all the time. Sometimes the work was, was fun and, you know, sometimes it wasn't, sometimes it just felt like drudgery. Um, but it was sort of a, it was was sort of a bright spot, you know, like when, you know, I would, um, you know, have, have a new boyfriend or, going on a date with somebody I was excited about, you know, 
Um, it, it was like, it was, it, it, then I would be, I would be going through the whole day of like doing what I have to do, but, but, oh, I get to hang out with so-and-so tonight, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I think also it has to do with like um, how the farm started. Part of the reason, part of the creation story of the farm um, was that Errol and Wolf, um, you know, were artists and they wanted <coughs> other artists to have a you know, better chance of surviving doing things that, that they liked. Um, mm -hmm. And Wolf had this idea about um, uh, possessiveness and jealousy, you know, sexual possessiveness and jealousy being the root of all, you know, conflict and all, you know, all these bad things. So, so, so the farm started out in part with the idea of, you know, getting rid of possessiveness and jealousy as a path towards greater cooperation and, you know, being able to live together outside the confines of, of, of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And capitalism, of course, being one of the major earth-destroying forces. Yes. Um, so, in your opinion, what are some of the ways that people can guard themselves against, in fact, actually toxic in some ways, like cult environments? And, yeah, yeah um, I mean, the number one thing that comes to mind is to cultivate self-trust. And... Um, you know, before I moved to Zendik, I had spent my entire life in school, um, you know, being told what to do. Um, I, I, I internalized from a very early age that I, what, what I, what I was supposed to do was get good grades. My mother never had to tell me sometimes, but I, I, I wouldn't have made the choice to just, you know, sit in a classroom all day. Um, so I, I didn't have much practice at sort of tuning in to the wisdom of my body. Um, and uh, post Zendik, I I noticed that there were there were a couple patterns that I that I noticed that when I lived at Zendik, I understood that those were signals that I could I could rely on from my body. You know that if I'm crying uncontrollably, something's seriously wrong. Uh, probably something's compromising my. Life. I feel like I don't have control over the rest of my life, and I better do something about that. So I think, but I think like it, it's hard to know because because. Ideally, self-trust would be something that, you know, the entire, that the family and the village is, um, is working to cultivate in any child as they're growing up. But maybe it is something that it's possible to, you know, cultivate as adults. I mean, in my case, I kind of had to go through the experience totally surrendering self-trust in order to see what that felt like um, and then learn how to, learn how to do the opposite. Hmm. And then there's also, you know, becoming aware of, um, becoming aware of the cult pattern. And for me, like, post-sendic, often I have found that it's very useful because uh, when I've been in situations where I'm being suspected, um, I, I find that, like, sometimes I feel like I have an advantage over other people in immediately noticing, oh, that's that feeling. Like, I used to have that feeling when Errol was talking to me, oh, something's wrong, something's definitely wrong. Even if nobody else knows it, I know it. So we are, I think it's kind of important to show, like, how people can come out. And, like, what you were saying, like, things that positively might have come out of this experience. And, mm -hmm. like, just talking about your life after this, if there you faced any kind of stigmatization. Um, I mean, there's definitely, there's a ton that's positive that's come out of it. And, I mean, I would say, like, if, when, if, if I were still stuck um, where I was when I left the farm, like, I would consider my moving there a tragic. However, of course, I didn't stay there. I, I grew and I moved. Um, so I see Zendik as this pile of, you know, stinky duck that I composted by turning the pile over and over for many years into a mound of fertile soil that I can use for my own growth and that in the form of my book and whatever else other people can use for their growth. So I have come to um, treasure the experience and all its tangled and twisted complexity um, for what I've been able to make out of it by facing it um, kind of in a, in a relentless way um, over the years. Um, now, okay, so you're asking what was, what, oh, about the stigma of being in a cult. So from the moment, when I, when I first read this book about cults and saw that the pattern described in the book fit Bendik, 
I did not have a single moment of shame. I was happier than I'd ever been in my entire life. Um, Because that meant I could, I didn't have to go back to Denver. I felt shame over it. And I immediately started talking about it. I was like, hey, like, I'm going to talk. This is great. <laughs> and I, and I, and I, you know, as you know, wrote about it very extensively yeah. um, and explained how it worked. So it was clear that I understood the pattern. But you asked me, well, like, how'd that happen? Like, <laughs> you're so smart, you know? Yeah. Um, Sigma, but I, but it, it, it is, it is, it is common. And as far as like, I mean, people coming, coming out of cults, like, I, um, you know, I would say to to own it, you know, to own it and to, you know, be willing to like face in detail, look in detail at whatever happened to you. Because and 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 in my case doing that, I did there were things um that I felt guilty about mm-hmm. and things that I apologized for. Um and guilt, as I understand it, is a useful emotion. It's like I have wronged you. And I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm going to make it right. Guilt is attached usually to very specific things. Whereas shame is just like, I'm a bad person. Um, but I think understanding the context in which cults exist, you know, can help. Like, if, if you join a cult as an well, not really join, but enter a cult as an adult, you know, you're doing that because you see it as the best, your best option for meeting your needs. Um, I think where this, like, how cults work or what they actually are because the word cult in our culture, Waco, um, mm-hmm. Jonestown, like, yeah. crazy. The triad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, blowing themselves up. Well, that was a long process. Um, they didn't, they didn't just, you know, do that overnight. Um, so really understanding how, how the pattern works, um, and how, and how the pattern is deeply keyed into, into, into basic human needs, um, you know, I think if you understand that, you're not going to stigmatize people who've been in calls. And this conference I was just at, I mean, there was like probably 250, 300 people there. Almost every single person there had been in the cult at some point. Mm. And it was great. It's like, hi, what cult were you in? Yeah, that's Tell cute. me about it. You know? <laughs> Ari, so much in common. I know. <laughs> really? These people are not losers. They're not idiots. Like, yeah. I like Highly intelligent, deeply empathetic people. Yeah. You know, it was somebody else who was in a call. No. Well, then am I? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I think it's it's a lot easier looking from the outside yeah. to be like, you know, oh, that's obviously me. You're like, these are my of, friends. Yeah. This <laughs> is but, my but like, group. If yeah. you're like in the position of like about to join a cult, I mean, you obviously didn't think it was a cult until... It just looks like a community. Yeah, it just is a community. I have a question, and this might be pressing, kind of, I don't know, but you mentioned that there were things that you felt guilty about. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you mind sharing some of that with us, like, in terms of your experience, or is that too? Oh, that's fine. Actually, I mean, the two things that jump immediately to mind was, um, this ended up not staying very long. He was new. He was younger than me. Um, I sort of immediately you know, had more status than him just because I'd been around for a while and he was new. Um, and we went on, I was attracted to him and we, we went, on, went on a walk together. Um, and I asked him if he wanted to um, kiss and he said no. And I kissed him anyway because, because you know, I, I thought he didn't really know what he wanted and because a similar incident happened another time and, but, you know, it was same but different. Um, and then later on, this same man, after he left, he wrote me a letter and he said, from the death culture. Um, I mean, I might have had a little bit of a pain, but not enough to acknowledge that this was a problem. Um, but, you know, years later when I got out and I got back in touch with him, I apologized in, by email. And then when I saw him in person for the first time, I apologized again. Um, and an- another thing that happened was in this period when I was sort of on the upswing with Errol, um, taking my turn at the top of the wheel, put up some, like, therapy for another for another woman um, in which she was supposed to like um, have a date with a different guy every week. Like that was my idea to cure her of her problem. Um, she, I am glad to say now, like immediately got back at me by hitting up my boyfriend um, <laughs> for her first date. Good job. Um, but You're like, that's that fair. Was really, <laughs> yeah, but that was an abuse of power on my yeah. part. You know, that yeah. was awful. I apologized. 
Can you kind of um, elaborate on like living therapy and kind of like what exactly that was and was it different every time? Was it kind of the same? Like, can you just elaborate? Therapy was that, you know, if you go to a shrink once a week, well, you're not going to make much progress. But if we are all therapizing each other all the time, (laughs) we are going to evolve much more quickly. So sometimes we would have living therapy meetings in which we'd all, you know, gather in the living room and, um, and just start talking and say, and then other people would comment. And of course, people with higher status, sort of, you know, what they said carried more weight. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, that person would receive a suggestion for like what they ought to do differently and, uh, you know, with not really uh, any help. But then living therapy also was just happening, you know, one on one or in groups or, you know, at, at any time, um, you know, someone could say, like, I don't like your vibe. I don't like your attitude. What's that look on your face? Um, you know, why aren't you making money selling or, you know, something like that. It was just, it, it, it was, you know, it was a, and I'm not saying that nothing good ever came out of it. I mean, I think that, that people certainly may have received um, clues about how to, you know, behave differently or received insights into, you know, things um, that were, uh, that were hard for them. But, and when I first moved to farm, I thought living therapy was great. Um, because to me, it was like, oh, attention. Like, if you were brought up in a living therapy meeting, then that meant people were noticing you and cared about you. And I just couldn't wait to, like, get brought up. <laughs> You're like, roast me, up. please. It wasn't, it wasn't as fun as I had thought it would be. We, we definitely want to give a substantial amount of time for you to talk about your book. And, mm-hmm. like, and the process of making the book. So, mm-hmm. first of all, what led you to write this book? Like, was there anything specific and are there any authors or other commentators that have inspired you? Did it just come like natural from your live journal or was it like? Um, well, I mean, I I think I had always been a writer. Writing was always very important to me, but I was also kind of scared of it because I always wanted my writing to be perfect the first time around. So (laughs) I became very constipated. Um, but, but I most like I had really expressed myself. Um, so that was kind of lying dormant. When I first felt like I had, you know, just received twin miracles, and the first miracle was that I had, along with other people, created this delusion that felt, and the second miracle was that I had made it out. And so, so that was what inspired me. I knew that in order to convey this to other people who hadn't been there, because it was just, you know, so intricate and so strange, but I, to, to, in order to immerse other people in that experience, I was going to need to write a book because a shorter piece was not going to do it. Um, so it didn't really come out of my live journal. My live journal, I think, was kind of um, – it was, it was in, in my live journal, I basically – I mean, that was kind of – in a sense, it was just me saying what was happening to me and some of that. Um, the memoir really wasn't – it really wasn't an expose. It was really themselves in it. And at a certain point, the live journal, I, I realized that um, crusading against Endic and writing the memoir were in conflict with each other. And I kind of pulled back from talking about it in public um, because I really needed to do a deeper, uh, a, a deeper exploration of like what I was up to. And, and people in my writing classes were like, wait a minute, this story is about you. It's not about Errol. It's not about Zendik. It's about you. And so coming back to that, you know, was like, okay, let's step away from talking about Zendik for a little while. Um, as far as writers who inspired me, I mean, um, of course, this book I read, Combating Cult Mind Control by Stephen uh, Hassan, I mean, that was a couple, I think it was maybe a year or so, cult memoirs, and like, <laughs> rode them all on a train trip to Seattle. Um, and my favorite, I found My Life in a Group Marriage Commune by Margaret Hollenbeck. She spent five months in, I think, 1970, in a group called The Family of Taos, um, and it was, it was a short time and it totally changed her life. Um, and what I really love about this memoir, um, is that it's, it's like detail brings the reader into the experience. You, you feel like you are there. And I kind of took her book as my, my Bible in my, in my years of working on my book. I wanted to achieve the same thing to really sen- sensually bring people into my experience. They could feel like they were there. Did you ever find, so you talk about transitioning from talking about the cult broadly to like realizing the story was centrally about yourself. 
Did you find it harder to talk about yourself, um, slightly more difficult to do that deep dive, or was it actually much easier to make that transition into? Um, well, I think uh, turning to self-examination was just a, a longer, slower process. Mm -hmm. um, it just, there are many, many layers I mean, once I, when I, as I was revising the book, it's like every time with every new revision, I was sort of looking, looking deeper on um, things and, you know, things I did and, and, you know, love affairs that I, that I ended because Errol said, or because I'd internalized what she would say. Um, so I don't know that it was easier or harder. It was just a more internal, reflective, you know, quieter, slower experience. But then that experience kind of came back around to giving me a different perspective on Zendik that was less about like, well, that was a really, um, in making me who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, at this point in my life, like, like I, I don't regret it. I wouldn't recommend it. You know? <laughs> I'm really grateful for it also. Yay! Yay! Isn't she amazing? She's so cool. I'm such a like, fan of her. Do you ever just come off as something and you're like, I'm so humbled? <laughs> like, I know. I'm like, I'm like, God, she's why did she us? Why did she do why did she agree to talk with us at all? But wow. she's super sweet and super amazing and um yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this. It's a little bit of different content, but probably better because she's amazing. Also, so, buy her book. Buy her book. It's called Maiden in Captivity. It is about her experiences at Zindic Art Farms. Uh, yeah, um, you can get it on Amazon. Yes. Probably Audible. I know a lot of YouTubers talk about Audible. I'm sure it's there. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds uh. of... Uh, promo ads for those but yeah, yeah she's amazing or just go buy the hard copy you know support Ooh, you could just buy support. the hard copy you could get a kindle version or, or pay a little extra support a lady who wrote a really 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 awesome buy both of them i'll get all editions buy she's amazing and she deserves it so yes. now Follow us on Instagram. <laughs> now let's just self promote ourselves. Um, follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe. Write her a review on Amazon. A five star review. Yes. Support her. Yes. Support her cause and her book. That's um, amazing. Okay. So that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you.